Good morning, everyone. As we change into a new year, our subject today is God is good. And don't you feel that God's already good? Wasn't that great seeing them out the front here? Murray, my heart just moved because I know the impact that you have had on, on all of my children. And uh, Murray's been a, a great, great friend over the years. And I, I, I should share with you one day about how he told me off when he was about 13 when I criticised one of his friends. And I thought I was being a good pastor's wife and telling him to be careful about someone who was a bit naughty. And he, do you know, he actually slid down the wall and sat on the floor and said, don't you dare talk about my friend like that. And he was right. He was right. He had a pure heart and a heart that just loved people and it was evident in everything that he did. And he really told me off that day. And I've never forgotten it, Murray. So bless you. So God is good. That's our topic today. And it comes out of the Psalms that we're reading as a church in our life journal. You can get one out the front over this uh, coming month. Um, a month of gratitude, a, gr a month of thanksgiving. And so today we're talking about Psalm 73, which is a psalm that starts with this great verse. In verse 1 it says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Surely God is good to Israel. Now Israel, we all take that for granted, that that means us these days. That's us. God is good to us, to those that are pure in heart. So there's a little bit of a rider there. So let's have a look at that first statement, because if we look at Psalm 73, the psalmist then goes down to have, then goes on to have a real lot of highs and lows. We'll talk about them a little bit later. But the first statement is, God is good. So we see that God is good all the time. He's good without favour. That means he's good to you, and he's good to you, and he's good to you, whether you believe it or not. He's good without limit. Without limit, as wide as you can go. From beginning to end, he's good. Without a summit, no matter whether you're high or whether you're low, God is good. Without end, infinite, he just is. And he's all sufficient. You're really quiet. I hope by the end you'll be jumping up and saying, yes, he is good. Isn't it hard sometimes for us to think, yeah, God's good? So hard sometimes. I just started wearing glasses, so I have to put them on and off. <laughs> it's goodness without turning. It's constant God's good. He's good all the time. Without favour, without limit, without summit, without end. He just is. He's all sufficient. And he doesn't need anyone or anything. He is complete. Because his nature is goodness. Now think about that for a minute. If we think about the fact that he's complete, he doesn't need anyone or anything. Because so often, goodness for us is contingent upon an, a whole pile of things. How we're feeling, what's happening to us, what we think's happening to us, etc. God says to us, give thanks to the Lord for his good. His love endures forever. Again, this, this theme that God is good always that it's never ending, it endures forever, forever, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the New Testament to today. God never changes. He's good all the time. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. Light is goodness, isn't it? We know that. Whoever... And then an injunction, whoever doesn't love 
doesn't know God because God is love. This whole concept that God is someone who can be trusted, who never changes. Have a look at this scripture. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father. We'll explore that a little bit later. Comes down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What an amazing thing. From the very first breath that you took to the very last one that you take, the stars in the sky never change. They're there. You can look up and see that they never change. It's a symbol of the infiniteness, infinite, infinite, (laughs) got it right? The infinite goodness of God that he gives perfect gifts and good gifts from beginning to end. There's no shadow of turning. He doesn't take his goodness away. He doesn't hide it. It's not hidden in darkness. There's no manipulation of it. His goodness is good forever and ever, infinitely, and it's unique. What an amazing thing. Doesn't change like shifting shadows, as James 1.17 says. He can't be turned from goodness and he can't be bought from being a good God because it's in his intrinsic nature. But for us, for humanity, goodness is a contingent thing. We can only sustain it if it comforts us or gives us some buyback, gives us some purchase. It's rarely able to self-sustain. For us, goodness is a negotiation because we can never always be good. It's manipulation. Now, we've got this month of gratitude and I started looking it up. I looked on Pinterest for all these lovely sayings and lots of quotes and everything. And every one of them talk about being happy by giving, being happy by doing good deeds, by self-love, by indulging in wellness therapy, etc. Okay? But every part of that is manipulation. It's contingent on how we're treated ourselves. If you do good to me, I'll reciprocate. It's negotiable. We know it's limited and it's fallible. Sometimes we're the perpetrators and other times other people are the perpetrators. But we're not good all the time. If we live long enough, we'll know that life itself isn't always good to us and kind to us. And people sometimes certainly aren't. In fact, we can get so buried in the bad that others do or that happens to us that we have to be reminded to be grateful and thankful. And that's what the psalmist says. When I say to you, God is good, we should be jumping for joy because we intrinsically know it in our spirit and our heart. But because we know it's so negotiable in our lives and we're so caught up in what happens to us in our daily lives, we have to be reminded to be grateful and thankful. See, the psalmist says we have to be pure in heart to understand that God is good. So what does that really mean? The problem is that nobody can be good except God. So let's have a look at this story from the New Testament that brings this together. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran out to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Jesus looked at him and he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. No one is good except God. Now Jesus is gone on his way at the beginning of this story to go to the cross. He's making his way to Jerusalem. It's the final week of his ministry and he's going to go to the cross. He's going to suffer and he's preparing the world and his team around him for the fact that he won't be there anymore. He's going to the cross. How can God, who is sending his son, who is doing it in obedience, be good? Perhaps put that next slide on. God sends his beloved son to death. How can God be good? Jesus is about to come into Jerusalem for his last week before he goes to the cross. How can a father lovingly send his son to death? Not only to death, but a horrific death. Think about the significance of this. How can Jesus in good faith say, don't call me good, only God is good when his father would do such a thing to him. To his beloved son, the one who he loves, to die a cruel death. You know, even if God knows the end from the beginning, as he does, and he knew that Jesus would rise again ultimately, that he's giving his life as a sacrifice for us, we'll talk about it. Why did Jesus have to suffer? What was it that was able for a loving father to stand aside and watch his son being tortured, suffering, to have nails put through his hands, his back broken open, stripped naked in front of his mother? Who allows that? What about those that were standing there? What about Mary? the mother of Jesus. Where's God as she's standing there watching her son dying on a cross? Yet Jesus says, only God is good. What about Mary, who Jesus saved from stoning? She loved him so much. She loved him so much that she spent all she had and came and lay at his feet and washed his feet with her hair in a culture that wouldn't let women in the room and took on the derision of the disciples. And there she is, her whole world crushing down as this man that she's given her life for is nailed to a cross. Where's God in the middle of that? The torture is real, the agony, the suffering, and the separation is real for Jesus. It's so real that he sweats drops of blood in grappling with the enormity of what is to befall him when he meets this man. And yet he says, don't call me good. Only God is good. So what's our response? We're exactly the same today as the psalmist. How can God be good? Look what he's done to me. He allows bad things to happen to good people, to innocent children. Look at that salami last week in Indonesia. and All those people that died, where's God? Don't tell me he's good. What about the five people that have died in, Adelaide, in, in Australia this year, just, just this last week, that have drowned? 
Where's God? We ask the same questions. The psalmist, let's go back to it. He says, straight after he says, God is good for those with a pure heart. He says, as for me, my feet almost slip. I've nearly lost my foothold. Because I envy the arrogant when I see prosperity for the wicked. He's angry about the state of the world, that people prosper, and he doesn't. Life will often have us slipping up and asking how God can be good. How many times have you cried that prayer? I've done it many times. Oh, I haven't had a pure heart when it's come to knowing that God is good. How many times have I said, God, I just asked you for this or that. I just wanted you to do this for me. Why did you do this? Why wasn't I healed? Why wasn't my child healed? I've cried to him in frustration and anger. I've even said that he's abandoned me. Once again, the psalmist says, Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and I've washed my hands in innocence. He starts to get indignant. How often do we do that? Oh God, it's all in vain. Why am I even here? Why do I come to church? Why do I try to live a godly life? It's all in vain. Because bad things happen to me. God, where are you? Yet Jesus says, only God is good. Sometimes we're so indignant about what we see as our own faithfulness and the purity of our motives. Listen to what the psalmist says. See if you can see any of this in his bitterness as he goes on. In verse 4, he says, Wealthy people, they've got no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Ever said that to God? Why she got that and I haven't? Why am I struggling and they seem to be blessed all the time? Why was she healed and why wasn't I? From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. I don't know about you, but when I look at the news, I can't believe what's happening in Australia. Our evil imaginations have no limits. How can God be good in the middle of that? When we see what's going around us in the world. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Don't know about you, but I've never felt so oppressed as a Christian when I look at the media today. We are more and more oppressed. Don't open your mouth. Don't say that God is good. He's not. That's what they say. Their mouths... <coughs> excuse me. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. And their tongues take possession of the earth. Isn't that the sign of the media? <laughs> their tongues take possession of the earth. Wow. Wow. There isn't anything new under the sun, is there? Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. More and more, the world is turning away from a God that is good and listening to the voice of those who claim the heavens. 
and say that God doesn't care about you. In fact, he's not even there. Listen to this last verse. How would God know? Does the Most High know anything? That's what they were saying about God back in the psalmist day, and it hasn't changed. But Jesus said, don't call me good. There's only one who's good, and that's God. If you lost your job next week, could you say with absolute certainty, through it all, God is good? If your marriage is in shambles today, can you say God is good? If your healing hasn't happened, can you say God is good? So Jesus is on his way to the cross when this man comes to him. He knows what's in front of him. He submitted to it. And he's got every reason to boast because he's being obedient to his father. And he says to this man, only God is good. When the guy asks for him about eternal life. So this guy is rich. And he comes to Jesus and he kneels before him and he says, good teacher, how do I get to heaven? Jesus looks at him and the Bible says that Jesus loves him. So Jesus knows that this guy has grown up in an atmosphere of knowing about God, keeping his commandments. <coughs> Excuse me. He knows this. The guy is kneeling at Jesus' feet. So he has a sense of reverence and a sense of wanting to hear from Jesus. A pure heart, you would say. Thanks, Sam. <coughs> <coughs> so Jesus says, only God's good. And then he goes on to say, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. He talks about the relational commandments. Commandments that have to do with us loving other people about us giving to other people, about sacrificing for other people, being honest. He doesn't talk about the commandments that come before that, which are all about loving God. He just tells this guy to get eternal life that he needs to obey these commandments. It's interesting. It's a really hard passage and the guy says to Jesus, teacher, all these things I've done since I was a boy. You see, this guy's a church kid. He acknowledges God's place in his life. He endeavours to live a good life. He tires, he goes to church, he gives to the poor. He's got a pure heart. He comes with no agenda. It's as good as it gets. See, he doesn't have the death and resurrection and saving grace of Jesus in his life because Jesus hasn't died yet. All he can go by is the law and Jesus tells him to fulfill it. Jesus specifically talks to him about relational laws because back in the day, what, what these guys were commanded to do was to bring all of the tithe and lay it down in their towns so that the sojourner, refugees, the fatherless, the widow, who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled, <coughs> that the Lord your God may bless you in the, all the work of your hands that you do. Now, 
So this guy says, I've done all that. So Jesus goes one step further and the scripture says he loves him and then says to him, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, we think most of the time this scripture is interpreted as being about tithing and about giving, about it being more than just works and that it being about discipleship. And it is. It says that the young man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. You know, Australia is such a wealthy country and we give so much so generously. Even this church, we give so much to missions. We're good people. We're pure of heart. We have great intentions. But Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, there's a step further. You have to follow me. You have to follow me. Jesus is saying it's not a social gospel. It's not Christian communism, as Bill would like to call it. Where if we just give away everything, if we sell our possessions, if we're all equal, then we've fulfilled the law and we're... We've got a pure heart. Now Jesus says, follow me. Is Jesus saying we can't be rich, that we can't have possessions? No, he's saying to this man that even though he honoured and acknowledged God, even though he bowed his knee, he didn't understand that following Jesus is bound up in the grace of God. The goodness of God. That free and perfect gift that comes down from our Father. Jesus, his Son, the perfect and good gift. Why do do the writers of Matthew, Mark and Luke string together that odd little sentence in that encounter. The man asks the question, how can I have eternal life? And prefaces it with good teacher. Jesus ignores it and says, don't call me good, only God is good. And ends up the the encounter by saying, follow me. You see, Jesus knew something about God and about trust in our lives. He knew something about the goodness of God, even though it cost him to follow God in obedience. Jesus knew that God was good all the time, no matter what. Even knowing that he was going to the cross to be separated from his father. You couldn't change Jesus' mind. He wasn't for turning. He wasn't for changing either. He, in turn, emulated his father. He, with a pure heart, was led to be obedient even to death on a cross. Jesus knew God was good. He knew God was good even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he cried out to his father and said, let it pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. How do you think Jesus felt as he was walking up that hill with a cross on his back after he'd been scourged and tortured and seeing the place that he was going to die? That he was going to be separated from his father? I don't know if Jesus knew that he was going to rise again. Perhaps somebody with better theological knowledge than me, can answer that question. But it wouldn't have been easy for him. But he knew God was good, 
even if he died, even if he's separated from God, his final thought, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even then, he was emulating the Father who is good. Without agenda, no shifting, no turning, Jesus did it. God, forgive them. And then he cried out to his Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Even then, he didn't know what was going to happen, but he surrendered his life to God. He knew God was good, even though God sent him to the cross. He knew it without a shadow of a doubt. That's what he's saying when he talks to this young man and says, follow me. So every time we confront a situation that we're not happy with, where we think God is not faithful, when he hasn't come through for us, when he's abandoned us, when he's not good, when we think we're being victimised, when we're not happy with the way the world is going, that we think things are out of control, that our lives are out of control, even unto death, do we know that God is good? It's a major commitment to follow him. Jesus, who took on the form of a man, and emptied himself and lowered himself, became flesh and died. He knew God was good. Let's look at it again. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. From your first breath to your last, there is no shadow to God's goodness. He doesn't change, and his gifts to you are perfect and good. Why? What was the thing that Jesus knew that he could say, even as he walked to that cross, that God is good? It's found in that beautiful old scripture. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved. God so loved that he even bypassed his love for his son and showered his love on us by giving his son as a sacrifice. How can we say that God is not good? How can we not know that his very presence and life is for us and that it's a good and a perfect gift? It's no coincidence in this story that eternal life is, a rem is mixed in with a reminder that God is good that the priority is the overarching message that covers our lives from start to end, from 2018 to 2019, that God is good because his ultimate good and perfect gift to us came down from the Father in the form of Jesus to die on our behalf. Jesus says, if you follow me, you'll find eternal life. You'll know whatever happens, that your life is governed by a good God whose perfect and good gift cost him his beloved son. So let's get back to that contingent part of our lives that we need to give over. The bargaining the trying to buy favour, the good works, negotiation with God, manipulation with God, cursing of God, yelling at God, anger at God. Our wealth, 
our goods, our job, our partner, our loved ones. None of those things matter. It's a simple trust, a pure heart. Matthew 5 says, Blessed are those who are pure of heart, for they shall see God. If you know God is good today, will you follow him wherever he leads you, whatever road you go down, wherever he places you, whatever cost he asks you to pay, whatever befalls you, As we cross over to 2019, let's give thanks for the Lord, thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Psalm 109, another beautiful psalm. These psalms are like honey. 1 John 4 and so that we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. The idea of trust. A pure heart means trust. A little child has a pure heart. They just trust. They jump off the counter into daddy's arms. That's a pure heart. Whatever he brings you away, will you follow wherever he leads? Whatever your road is, can we live in love? Do you think your heart's pure today? It's got nothing to do with whether you sell your goods and give them to the poor. I hope you do, because that's the road that God's led me down. I never thought 20 years ago that I would be feeding orphans Sorry, not orphans, but I would f be feeding little kids in Ghana so they could go to school. I wouldn't have counted the cost back then, but I would now, and I do now. There were things that I wasn't happy about when God first called me to do some things. Some things were easy. It was easy to come and help start this church and build it. It's been a great joy. It's cost, but it's been a great joy. Other things have been incredibly hard, cost me dearly. I've wrestled with God so much. My heart hasn't always been pure in my response to him. So there's times that we don't make it. But God's asking us today, as we go into 2019... Is your heart pure? And of course it starts at the cross. It's not about what we do, what we don't do. It's that grace. It's knowing that God is good because he sent his son to die in your place. Can we take that into our hearts today? If you don't know Jesus, just in a little bit of time, a little bit later, we're going to make a call for you to actually in your heart say, Jesus, I acknowledge you. Romans 10 says we just have to say the word, knowledge that God is real in our lives. Can you genuinely give thanks in all circumstances, knowing that all good and perfect things come from your Father? That's another challenge for us today. Where are you at in that? Is it a challenge to you? Can you genuinely give thanks? I suggest you try it. One of the biggest breakthroughs in my life is to look with gratitude at what I have instead of what I don't have. And I don't mean materially, because we're all blessed in Australia. We don't know what poverty is. Go to Africa. giving thanks, being grateful for what God has given us in all of the things that we have. Do you know when I first started a gratitude diary, I did it for 30 days initially. I had to think of three things a day 
that I was grateful for. Do you know, I was so screwed up in seeing the glass half empty instead of half full that on the very first day, I didn't know what to be thankful for. You know, I couldn't even be thankful for my family because all I could do was grumble about them. They never helped me. You know, the old martyr spirit. You know, why don't they do the dishes? I'd be better off without them. You know the thoughts you have. Come on. We all have them, don't we? We think about the bad about those we love instead of the good. We think about the glass half empty instead of half full. Do you know, by the end of that month, I was a totally changed person. If you don't know God is good, if you can't break through from the negative thoughts that you have, if you can't break through from the brokenness in your life, if you can't break through into uh, 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 breaking through into some of the blessing and perfect gifts that God has for you, maybe you need to start being thankful and seeing life in a totally different um, vein. God is good. Do you really need to rely and start trusting in God? Start thanking him and stop blaming him for things that aren't going your way. Maybe you do need to heed the challenge to live in God's goodness, being aware of what he has given you. Is there a challenge for you to sell all that you have and give to the poor? I don't mean literally, although for some of you it might mean opening the purse strings and being generous. Some people are so stingy. Do you know how much you are blessed if you give? Bill comes to me just about every week now and says, let's give this to somebody. Let's give that to somebody. And I think, oh Lord, if only I could retire. And that list is getting longer and longer. And God's called me to it. He hasn't said I can retire yet. Because one day in Ghana, I like to think in 30 years' time when I'm dead and gone, that maybe the Prime Minister of Ghana might say, I was educated and I went to school and I was fed every day by a woman who gave money to feed me from Australia. Who knows? Who knows the miracles? This church came to being because a farmer a hundred years ago, old Mr. Simons, walked around his land and said, God, could you raise up a church here in this, build, in this land? It's a true story. His family members have given us the papers. Old Mr. Simons prayed into, into being something that has come to pass that has been a great blessing and we're just a small part of it maybe God is saying to you today open your purse strings maybe God is saying to you be generous give go beyond what you are because you aren't poor God is good to you he has given you every good and perfect gift that's what follow me means and that's what eternal life means and as the psalmist said that's what a pure heart is blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God that's eternal life maybe God's calling you to be obedient to something in 2019 as we close but as for me it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all your deeds. I'm here today to tell you guys, God is good. Do you agree with me? Let's say it. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. All the time. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
that you are eternal. That you put the stars in the heavens to remind us from our first breath to our last breath that you give every good and perfect gift. And that you are not for turning, that you never change, that you don't hide in the shadows, that you in fact are good all the time. Father, help us to follow you. Help us to understand at the core of our being with childlike faith, with a pure heart, that only you are good. That we can't put our trust in anything else but you. Father, we thank you that you were not a cruel, capricious God in sending your son to the cross, but in fact you are a good God because you gave your most precious Thanks. thing to save us, to make us pure, to wash us clean, not by any works that we do, but by your grace, by your good gift, that we can have eternal life because of your goodness in giving Jesus. Father, we thank you for that story. Let us not go away sad because we cannot pay the price. Father, may we be faithful servants and follow you. As we begin 2019, Father, I pray, let us with open hearts, with pure hearts, with open hands, stand before you and dedicate ourselves to you and say, God, I'll follow you because you're good and I trust you and I want to live in your presence in 2019. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus, that you came and gave yourself for me. Yeah. Thank you, God, that you gave me every good and perfect gift. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.